Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome to the EKG of the Week. I hope you're having a wonderful week, and I'm glad you could join us. This week's case is an 84-year-old male with a history of hypertension that presents with a fever. His EKG is shown here. Now, before we get started, let's review the approach we've been using to interpret EKGs. So notice that we have the patient's clinical presentation and then the EKG below it. On the right side of the screen, we have a list that we'll go through before making our final interpretation. First, there is the regularity of the rhythm. That is, are we dealing with a regular or irregular rhythm? And if it's irregular, is it regularly irregular or irregularly irregular? Next, we have the heart rate, in which we simply wanted to determine the rate of the rhythm. Then we have the rhythm origin. That is, where is the rhythm actually starting from within the heart? Then we have to find the ventricular or QRS axis, which could help us with our differential diagnosis. Then there's the atrial, atrial ventricular, and intraventricular, or IV conduction. And here we want to look at if the conduction is normal or abnormal. That is, is it prolonged? Then we have the waveforms, which would include all the waves, the segments, and intervals. And lastly, is there anything else? You know, Is there anything else that we've missed or still need to mention here? After that, we'll use all this information we've gathered to make a final interpretation of the EKG. Now I want you to pause the video and take a few minutes to go through it yourself. When you're ready, start the video and we'll go through it together. Okay, so our 84-year-old male with hypertension presents with fever, okay, and he has this EKG. So let's take a look at it, all right? So first off, what is the regularity of this rhythm? Well, on first impression of the EKG, you probably notice that the rhythm appears quite irregular throughout. This means that we're dealing with an irregularly irregular rhythm, okay? So one of the main things we do is we tend to use the R waves or whatever, a, a big wave in the QRS complex to look at regularity, okay? And regularity means R is the distance between these intervals the same throughout. So if we use this R wave here to the next one, this is our R to R interval, okay? You can see that it's clearly different from the next one, okay? Here's our next R to R interval, okay? And if you went through out the whole EKG, you can see that it's constantly changing. If you have your calipers or have a piece of paper, you can measure this out and you'd see that it's always changing throughout. So we call this an irregularly irregular rhythm, okay? So we'll write that irregularly irregular, okay? So no regularity to this rhythm whatsoever. Now, what did you get for the heart rate? So remember, we're dealing now with an irregular rhythm, okay? So how can we find uh, the rate here? Well, one of the main things I wanted you to know is that the whole standard 12 lead EKG represents 10 seconds, okay? So this is 10 seconds in durations. So if you multiply that by six, that's 60 seconds, which is one minute. Meaning that if we count the number of complexes going across the EKG and multiply that number by six, we can get an estimate of the rate in beats per minute. So let's try that, okay? So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, okay, so 12 QRS complexes we can see clearly going across, and what we do here is we take 12, we multiply it by six, and that's 72 beats per minute, okay? Now I have the actual EKG in front of me, and what we see here is that the actual rate was 72 beats per minute. So in this case, we have the estimate that we got uh, is actually the one that showed up from the EKG machine. So you can see that doing this process is actually uh, quite helpful and can get you close to the actual rate, and the exact rate in this case. Now how about the rhythm origin? Well, we have narrow QRS complexes, so it must be supraventricular in origin that is originating above of the ventricles. We can also make out, we cannot make out any clear uh, P waves in any lead here, okay? We can't see them in leads two, we can't see them in lead V1. So at this point, all we can say is that we're dealing with a supraventricular rhythm, but certainly not sinus rhythm, okay? So if you, here's lead two and here's lead V1, oftentimes we can see the ones that more of a short axis view of the atrium, we can see both sides of them, okay? And in this case, we can't even make out any P waves, okay? So either the atria is quivering, okay? And we can't really make out because we have no full atrial uh, contractions or depolarization, uh, so it's not coming up on the EKG. And in lead two, which we tend to see because the P wave axis is direct, uh, directed in that direction, um, we can't make out any P waves there, okay? So uh, in this case, all we can say is that we are dealing with a supraventricular rhythm, okay? So we'll write supraventricular, meaning that it's above the ventricles, okay? And we can tell that because we'll see that our QRS complexes appear uh, normal in duration.
All right, let's move on to the ventricular or QRS axis now. So you should have gotten a leftward shifted QRS axis that is borderline of abnormal. The actual value here was negative 25 degrees, okay? So the actual QRS or ventricular axis was negative 25 degrees. So let's see, how do we find uh, ventricular axis? So you have to remember that uh, we have zero degrees here and that's where lead one's positive end sits, okay? We have positive 90 degrees that sits down here and this is the positive end of AVF that sits uh, at that point okay then we have plus or minus 180 degrees and then here negative 90 degrees now if you recall the normal ventricular axis lies somewhere between negative 30 degrees okay and somewhere in this region which is about positive 105 to positive 110 degrees so anyways just in this region here is considered normal you have a leftward shift if you're up in this region, so this is leftward axis deviation, and that's more of a pathological leftward axis deviation. If it's in this region, that would be more physiologic, okay? Because as we get older, we go from more of a rightward to a leftward shift with age, okay? If you recall, with children, as they come out in the first early month, they have more of a rightward shift because the right ventricle was pretty much the dominant ventricle uh, in utero, especially in those latter weeks of gestation. And up until that first, the end of the first month, then we get more of a leftward shift as the left ventricle starts to take over. Now we have a rightward shift in this region, and this is what we call an extreme access deviation, okay? Or sometimes referred to as no man's land. That's more of a uh, rare form that you'll see or rare access shift. So here, where he said that we have a, an, a leftward shift that's borderline, meaning that it's negative 25, so we said it's somewhere in this region. So how do we get that? So we have to look at leads one, leads ABF, and in this case, we'll also look at lead two. So we have lead one, which is here, okay? And you can see that it's mostly positive, our QRS complexes. So that means we're gonna be heading towards lead one. If we look at lead AVF, you can see that we have mostly negative complexes, okay? So below baseline, if this is the positive end of AVF, that means we're going away from it. That means our access lies somewhere here. The reason we're looking at lead two is because we're not sure if we're in that normal physiologic leftward shift or this pathological uh, region, okay? And in order to determine that, we use lead two. So here's lead two. And if we draw lead two, it comes down at positive 60 degrees and that's lead two's positive end. And if what's perpendicular to that positive 60 is in fact this line here that goes through that negative 30 degrees. And how that helps us is because if lead two is positive, that will put us on this side and in the, our normal range. And if it's negative, it'll be on more of the pathological leftward shift. So in this case, you can see that it's somewhat isoelectric, okay? Maybe slightly positive. Um, so because it's slightly positive, it puts us more in this region here, okay? So more of that physiologic leftward shift, uh, but really borderline here, okay? So the actual QRS axis here was negative 25 degrees. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, how about atrial conduction? Well, typically we look at leads two and V1 for P wave or atrial abnormalities. However, since we can't make out any clear P waves here, we can't really make any comment on atrial conduction other than to say it's likely abnormal, okay? So we have abnormal atrial conduction here. All right, how about the atrioventricular or AV conduction? Well, in this case, we're looking for any conduction delays as the impulse travels between the atria and ventricles. And because the majority of the PR interval represents AV nodal conduction, we will look there. The normal PR interval in adults is between 120 and 200 milliseconds, which is three to five small boxes. And here we said that we can't make out any P waves, so we can't locate the start of the PR interval, and therefore we really don't have a PR interval and can't comment on AV nodal conduction. So Remember, when we talk about the PR interval, if we draw our complex here, so here's our P wave, this is our QRS complex, and T wave, okay? The PR interval is from the beginning of our P wave to the start of our QRS complex, okay? Because we don't have a P wave, we really can't make out that PR interval, okay? Remember, the PR segment is from the end of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex, okay? And again, we don't even have a PR segment in this case either, okay? So in this case, uh, we have an absent or we really can't uh, make out the AV nodal conduction in this case. So 
How about the intraventricular or IV conduction? Okay, so here we're looking at the duration of the QRS complexes or the QRS interval. The normal QRS duration is often between 70 and 110 milliseconds or about two to three small boxes. The main thing we're checking for with um, IV or intraventricular conduction is that the QRS interval is not prolonged anywhere. We can see narrow QRS complexes here that appear within normal limits. In fact, the QRS duration here was 88 milliseconds. So 88 milliseconds is within that normal range between 70 and 110 milliseconds and you can see clearly we have narrow QRS complexes uh, throughout our EKG okay so we have normal um, IV nodal conductor or IV conduction intraventricular conduction so how about the waveforms well we said we can't locate any P waves so there's no P waves there there does appear to be some abnormal Q waves present Okay. And if you notice, those are in those inferior leads, 3 and AVF, as well as the anteroseptal leads, V1 through V3, which may suggest prior inferior and anteroseptal infarction. There may have also been right ventricular involvement, although we can't confirm this without those right-sided leads in place. So what we're saying here is we have these abnormal Q waves that are present in two conti anatomically contiguous leads. Okay. So they are in fact significant. So here's lead three, here's lead AVF and these Q waves, okay? There's another one there. It's hard to make that one out in that point. Now in V1, V2 and V3, okay? Our anteroseptal leads, so you can see that there's clearly the Q waves, okay? Now notice that these are not, this is not any Q wave there in V4. This is a R wave and this is an S wave, okay? Remember the Q wave is the first negative deflection after the P wave of the QRS complex, okay? And it's a negative. And remember the S wave is the first negative deflection after the S wave, okay? Or after the R wave. Okay, so now that the, we have the T waves uh, present, okay, and you can clearly make out our T waves. Here's a T wave there, okay, and you can see them throughout uh, the EKG, and they appear present, asymmetric, and normal. Now, without the P wave, we said we can't comment on the PR segment or the PR interval. The QRS intervals we mentioned were normal. Uh, the QRS amplitudes we appear within normal limits. The ST segment doesn't appear significantly elevated or depressed anywhere. The QT interval appears within normal limits here. So overall, the only major waveform abnormalities are with the abnormal Q waves, okay? And that's with in leads three AVF, V1, V2, and V3. So let's write that here. We have these abnormal Q waves, okay? We said three in AVF, our inferior leads, and then we mentioned V1 through V3, okay? Covering the anteroseptal region. So is there anything else we missed here? Well, how about the R wave progression in the precordial leads? Normally the R wave amplitude should progressively increase from V1 through V5. Although that's not the case here, it may suggest prior myocardial damage in that anteroseptal region. So if you look here, remember R normal R wave progression means that our R waves are continuously increasing in amplitude from V1 up until V5, okay? So we can't really make up that initial R wave uh, in V1, okay? Same thing in V2, V3, and then we start to see an R wave in V4, okay? And slowly it starts to increase in amplitude up until V6. But this is what we consider um, abnormal R wave progression, okay? Especially in that earlier region that may suggest uh, some myocardial damage in the anteroseptal uh, part of the heart. So abnormal R wave progression, okay? Now, the transitional zone in the precordial leads uh, appears to occur between leads V5 and V6, which we consider a late transition. This transitional zone is simply the precordial lead area where the QRS transitions from being mostly negative to being mostly positive, with the actual transitional area uh, to be where the QRS complex is completely isoelectric. Normally, the transition occurs between leads V3 and V4. If it occurs earlier than V3, we call this a counterclockwise rotation or early transition. And if it occurs after lead V4, then this is considered a clockwise rotation or late transition. So because it occurs after lead V4, this is considered a clockwise rotation or late transition. So if you look here, we can see that we're going, we're still negative here negative, mostly negative, still mostly negative, still mostly negative, okay? And then in V6, we see mostly positive complexes, okay? So going from mostly negative 
to mostly positive occurs in this region between V5 and V6, okay? And because it's happening after V4, we call this a late uh, transition, okay? Or a clockwise rotation, okay? Either way is the same thing, okay? So now one thing to keep in mind with this R-wave progression in the transitional zone is that they're highly dependent on lead placement. So what is our final interpretation? Well, we have an irregularly irregular rhythm with supraventricular origin at a rate of 72 beats per minute. We could not make out any P waves, but intraventricular conduction appeared normal. We found that we had borderline abnormal leftward shift in the ventricular axis, as well as abnormal Q waves in the inferior and anterior septal leads. Additionally, we noted the poor R wave progression in the late transition in the precordial leads. So if this, uh, this is an abnormal EKG that demonstrates atrial fibrillation with likely prior inferior and possible anterior septal infarct in the leftward shift in the ventricular axis, the poor R wave progression, and the late transition in the precordial leads are only supporting evidence to myocardial uh, damage in that anterior septal region, okay? So let's just write our final interpretation, we have an abnormal EKG, okay, and we have inferior involvement because of those abnormal Q waves, so inferior MI and possible anteroseptal MI, okay, so this is uh, possible, and then both of these are age undetermined, meaning we cannot determine when they take in, they've taken place, okay? It could be a year ago, uh, it could be a week ago, we just uh, can't know because remember, when we talk about myocardial damage, this is a dynamic process that goes through changes much faster than you would see, uh, for instance, in like acute pericarditis, okay? So in conclusion, our 84-year-old male with a history of hypertension that presents with a fever has an abnormal EKG that shows atrial fibrillation with evidence of inferior impossible anteroseptal infarct of undetermined age. Well, that's the end of this week's EKG of the week. I hope you learned something. Please don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below if you like what we're doing. In fact, many of you have asked how you can help us out. Really, the best way would be to simply subscribe and share this resource with your friends. You get free access to more than 300 videos. There's also a community of over 150,000 of us like-minded individuals on Facebook. So stop over and join the EKG Guys Facebook community. If you need a crash course on EKGs, we launched our new EKG course. Check the link below if you're interested. The original cost is around $100. $150, and I believe I made it less than $20 for a limited time. I may be biased, but after reading nearly every EKG textbook on the market, I think this is by far the best EKG series to take you from the beginner level to a physician level. I've even included our pediatric lectures. Anyways, check it out for yourself. I think you'll really enjoy it and a number of medical schools and hospitals are beginning to use it. If you are a part of an institution, please contact us because we're giving a limited number of schools and hospitals free access to provide feedback and improve our course. And in that case, you can get the course for free. So leave a comment below and get in touch with us. And of course, check out our brand new website ekg.md, the premier EKG resource for medical professionals, where you can find more lessons and practice. That is www.ekg.md. Last but certainly not least, your feedback is incredibly helpful and your kind words are always an encouragement on those long days. So let us know how we're doing. Thank you again for your support. It is truly appreciated. We're the largest, fastest growing EKG resource in the world.